with this. Um, so hello everybody, Kelly Ryan here, for those of you who don't know me, although I think you do by this point. <laughs> Um, I'm a registered holistic nutritionist and I help uh, exhausted moms who want their energy back and to feel clear so that they can have fun with their kids and just generally feel awesome. Anyways, uh, today we're interviewing a friend of mine, Hillary. And um, Hillary is a certified sleep consultant. She has been helping hundreds of families teach their little ones to sleep through the night since 2015. She provides supportive sleep programs and coaching for parents for children from three months to 10 years old. Whether you have a baby who's waking every hour or an eight-year-old with anxiety around sleep, Hillary's individual sleep, individualized sleep plans help families get the rest they need so kids can thrive and parents can be the best versions of themselves. Hillary is also a registered physiotherapist and a mom of two of her own little beans, age four and six, and she works with families struggling with their children's sleep throughout Canada and internationally. So um, if Right now we are live, and uh, if you're watching this live, you should see a little live um, button up in the corner. If you don't, you're watching the replay, and that's great too. <laughs> you just can't ask questions. You just can't ask questions. You can only ask questions on the live version. So welcome, Hillary. How are you? Thank today? you. I'm good. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks good. for uh, thanks for inviting me on. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, I guess just, uh, well, you know yourself, but just for everybody out there, um, it's kind of funny because a couple of years ago, I have, well, I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old now, uh, but a couple of years ago, I was struggling an awful lot with my youngest, my little boy, uh, sleeping through the night. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of funny because I was very, very protective over my little girl's sleep. And so much so that I was afraid to let my little guy wake her up at night, you know, so I'd go and I'd be like, Shh, you know, be quiet. <laughs> you can't wake up with your sister, you know? Um, and I knew what I was doing because I'd gone through it all already with my daughter. Um, but you know, I guess I was so afraid to wake her cause she was a rock star sleeper that mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to mess up her sleep, but in that I wasn't teaching him good habits. Right. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think sometimes chance steps in or whatever, um, because I met you Hillary then, um, at a wellness fair that we we're both attending. She was in the booth across from me. <laughs> um, and I entered to try and win a session with you and I won. I never win anything. You won. <laughs> I won. Obviously, you told me your story. I was really hoping you'd win, but I'm like, I have to. I have to be honest. I got to draw this out of a hat, and it was your name. I was so happy for you. I was so happy too. <laughs> I guess sometimes when you really need something, it happens, right? Exactly. You put it out there. Yeah, exactly. So then, you know, uh, me and Hillary, we had our session. We worked together, and um, luckily, I was pretty close. You know, mm -hmm. and Hillary gave me some tips and tricks. And then, yeah, from there, um, now, I mean, you know, you have your odd night where they're sick and whatever. Of course, yeah. I mean, it, it's like night and day with mm -hmm. him sleeping now, right? Completely, completely different child, completely different family. We're all so much happier now. Changes everything. Sleep changes everything. It's the basis. It's the ground on which we all stand the rest of the day. Yeah. Amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No. I don't know what I'd do without it. I don't no. know. I don't know how I would do this job without a full night's sleep. Yeah. And like you said, it's not a hundred percent of every night. It's not 365 nights of the year because your kids are going to get sick once in a while. Um, you know, there's the occasional nightmare, but if they've got really good sleep habits, there's actually less nightmares. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I can believe that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So <laughs> it's a, uh... Um, so, okay. Yeah. So basically what we just went through was my story for anybody who is live. Um, so, and I'm just kind of watching this cause it's, it, it says to me it's live on Facebook. So, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. 
I get still going. Okay, good, good, good. Um, okay, so uh, basically what I wanted to do this evening, I know with um, me, I have a lot of uh, people that I talk to in my world, you know, I mean, exhausted moms, who they, they're finding that their own children aren't sleeping through the night. And it's one thing to be exhausted because you're not eating well or um, you're not exercising enough or something like that. But when mm -hmm. it's as fundamental as you're not even getting enough sleep, you need mm -hmm. to deal with that first, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just... Yeah, it's a snowball effect because if you're not sleeping well, you crave the wrong foods mm -hmm. and you don't take the time to, to make the right foods and you don't, have the, you don't have the will or the energy to exercise and then you get the snowball of the kind of stuff that you work help moms with. Right. And, you know, because that basis isn't there yet. Yeah. And if, I know it can be maybe sometimes a little bit of cart and horse because what you eat can affect how you sleep. But that's if it's your own sleep. I mean, when you're dealing with somebody, like yeah. trying to help somebody else's sleep, and they're the one that's keeping you up, then it almost doesn't matter what you're eating, right? You have to take care of the external problem, not problem. Exactly. Yeah. External issue first, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, I guess on that note, let's get started with the actual question. <laughs> um. I love talking about sleep. I know. I love, I love doing it. The second best thing is talking about it. Talking about it. Yeah. I get that because I'm the same way with food. Right. <laughs> food right. 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 I guess it's all like what you're into, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So um, first question, I guess, is what are some of the problems that you help families deal with? Um, so it depends on the age group. Um, and while I did, uh, I did say I do work with families with kids, you know, as young as three months, as old as 10 years. Um, but I do have a newborn plan. It's different. It's like more like it, with newborns. Um, it's those newborns that are not the sleep anywhere, anytime kind of newborns and their parents just like, I just want to get off on the right foot because I've heard the horror stories of what my friends are all going through. I don't want to go through that. What do I do to get off on the right foot? And so I do have like a very um, mini plan that's more of a how to plant the little seeds mm -hmm. so that your little one learns how to sleep on their own yeah. so that they're not dependent on a prop. So a sleep prop is the, really the thing that I'm helping most of the families I work with uh, to get to, um, to deal with and to get rid of. So a sleep prop is anything that a baby or a young child needs outside of themselves, outside of their own brain to body program for how to shut down and fall asleep um, that helps them to get to sleep. So for an, a baby, it's often um, they can't fall asleep unless they're on the boob or have a soother in their mouth or they're being rocked or they're in motion. I've got a 16 month old right now that I'm about to work with, not my own, of yeah. families, um, a 16 month old that I'm about to work with that has never fallen asleep anywhere but a bouncy chair, even though her mom knew that this is not a safe sleep space. Yeah. You, do, you do what works in the moment because you're desperate and sleep, lack of sleep actually makes us kind of desperate and it clouds our judgment. So even though, you know, when we were pregnant, we had all these ideas about how to keep our baby safe and how to do what's best for our baby. When you start getting really honestly sleep deprived, your judgment is out the window. And I've been there and I've done things that I never thought I'd do. Um, because you want to, you just, you just need to get to sleep. It almost feels like a desperate feeling. And that's when you're in the throes of like your baby waking up every hour or two um, and taking a long time to fall asleep. So if your baby doesn't know how to fall asleep on their own and they haven't kind of connected those dots in their brain yet for how to just close the eyes and shut down, the, you know, that takes a lot of intervention. So all those interventions are what we call sleep props. So whether you need to rock your baby for an hour and a half until they fall asleep, and then they're up another half an hour later, or they need to pop a soother in seven times a night, or you need to get up and feed them back to sleep. Those are some of the big baby issues that I work with. Yeah. When it comes to the older kids, when it comes to toddlers and preschoolers, a lot of times it's the, well, I need another glass of water. Well, now I need another hug and now I need another this. And, that. and then you've got this like two hour long drawn out bedtime battle. And then, so it's a real um, process around 
supporting your kid. It's always about supporting your child, but really about laying the boundary around, whoa, 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 whoa. this is, this is sleep. This is important. Mm -hmm. So just as you would treat, like, we're very, very good at treating food properly with our kids. Like most of us are anyway, we want to give them three meals a day. We want to give them a couple of snacks. We want to make sure they get protein. We want to make sure they get this. So it's the same sort of thing. You want to make sure they get sleep and that they know how to sleep. It's as important as feeding them. So, um, you know, when it comes to the preschoolers and the, even the older toddlers, a lot of it is around the boundaries around sleep, just like you have boundaries around other things in your house. Like, you know, you don't get in the car without putting a seatbelt on or without putting the, the, the five point restraint on, because that's just the right thing to do. This, you, have, you develop the same mindset. And so I help the parents develop the mindset around sleep that maybe they haven't had yet that actually, no, this is as important as feeding your child. Um, you wouldn't give them junk food all day. You shouldn't let them have junk sleep. Um, so laying the boundaries around sleep, creating really good habits that make the child feel comfortable, confident, and, and content, basically, to crawl into bed and go to sleep at a reasonable hour every night and sleep through the night. Yeah. When it, sorry, just to finish the oh, question, when it comes to the older kids, then the sort of five to 10 group, a lot of those families will call me when their kids have ha are having anxiety around sleep and anxiety start to creep up. And there's lots of normal places that anxiety creeps up, like uh, starting school for the first time or um, switching schools or moving or um, a new child coming into the family. There's lots of really normal reasons why a child would experience anxiety, like normal anxiety. Then there's like the realm of anxiety disorder. And there's some red flags that I will look out for there and kind of steer the families in the, in the, in the direction of getting, finding a, a, a really qualified counselor. But when it comes to bedtime anxiety, a lot of it is around the, when I work with families, it's around empowering the child around sleep and dealing with the fears head on addressing them in a way that helps them integrate it on a real neurological level that helps like the, the primitive fight or flight brain that really acts up at nighttime to help that part of the brain really integrate with their logical thinking brain. And there's a way to do that with young kids, even as young as four and five. And it really sinks in with the kids who are like eight, nine and 10 um, because you can, you can educate them, you can empower them, and you can help them develop their confidence. It's really awesome to see it happen. That really makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, um, especially like at all the different ages. And I mean, like, well, I've seen the sleep prop part of it myself, yeah. right? Because yeah. I mean, with my little guy, it was, it was a soother. Yeah. He, you know, and it was the same thing. I think that's part of the reason why Mm -hmm. you know, like we had a lot of work trying to get rid of that soother, you know, yeah. and, um, then to, like you said, it's, it's setting up the boundaries and it's funny because I remember being kind of terrified because at that point it was like, oh my God, he's like, I don't know, three or I think it was two or three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. I think three, we were right? Yep. And thinking like, there's been all this time of him doing this one thing. This is going to be really hard. And I think it was like a week. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. And the funny thing is it's, it's usually, it's interesting that it's the soother that really makes the parent feel like, <gasps> you know, cause when they, parents will call me sometimes and they'll say things like, so no more soother ever. Like that's impossible. My child has never fallen asleep without it or has always had it. Or it's like this, it's like you're asking them to remove a limb from their child. Right. <laughs> when really it is the easiest sleep prop to get rid of because there's no emotional attachment between a child and their soother like there's the and I mean even children who are breastfeeding to sleep and there's a big attachment there and there's a like yeah. a big emotional component to that yeah. even those kids if you do the right supportive type of plan you're this is not like you know shut the door cried out see you later baby sort of thing this is a really supportive be there beside your child as they figure out how to learn this kind of work. And even, even then, even if it's something as emotionally involved as breastfeeding to sleep mm -hmm. every single night and every single nap, yeah, they'll learn within a week. Yeah. They get it. This is something so natural. Um, we just need to give them the chance to learn and they yeah. all have it in them to learn. Yeah. And it's funny because like, you think like, uh, you hear, oh, I slept like a baby. Right. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> you seen my baby? Have you seen my baby? <laughs> my baby. You don't want to sleep like my baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, you know, it, it isn't, it, 
it's not really innate per se. It's like, it's a learned thing. It seems mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. there's about 20% of babies that are like, they, they call them the angel babies <laughs> and all our babies are angels, but really there's the one, there's the angel babies that just come home from the hospital or, you know, if they, if they were born there and they just, they just sleep. And yeah. they never look back and they just sleep through the night. And by three months old, they're sleeping 12 hours a night. And their moms don't talk about it at the play group because they know the dirty, dirty looks they're going to get because it's such a small percentage of the babies that actually do that. And the rest of us have to work on it a little bit. You know, it is a learned skill. Yes. That said, there is an added challenge for our generation because anyone listening, um, I always ask the question, who has a mom or a mother-in-law that has ever said, oh, I never had a problem getting my babies to sleep. Cause uh, you know, I've had both. Like my mom was like, you do what for a living? Yeah. I had four kids. I had four kids. You all just like slept through the night one day. And I went into your room at seven o'clock in the morning with my heart in my throat and you were fine. You yeah. just decided when it was time to sleep through the night. But the difference now for our generation is that we put our babies to sleep on their backs. Um, and in the generations and in fact, millennia before us, babies were put to sleep on their bellies where they can't do that jazz hands reflex in the first four months of their life, that moral reflex, and startle themselves awake all the time. When they're on their bellies, they're all cozied in, right? And they, they uh, um, can't startle themselves awake. Yeah. So we, you and me, moms, aren't going to run in and try to soothe them back to sleep with whatever works every two hours. Right. So that's how moms get into habits now of doing whatever works, whatever works, because my baby is like basically startling, you know, you'll, you'll rock them to sleep and then you'll put them down in their bassinet and you'll like sort of stealth ninja your hand out and they'll startle themselves awake. And so that's where the habits start. And even though that reflex sort of disappears and integrates within about four or five months, the habits are laid. Yeah. The habits are there. So I'm not against back to sleep at all because it has saved countless babies' lives. It is belly sleeping was linked very closely to SIDS as the biggest risk factor for SIDS. So they just, you know, blanketed the Western world with this back to sleep public health campaign and it it has worked. Yeah. But what it's done is it's made it harder for babies to learn how to naturally self-soothe and to naturally extend their sleep to sleep through the night. So that instead of getting better and better and better and better at sleep, they often will get worse and worse and worse as Mm -hmm. time goes on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. You know, it really mm-hmm. does. And uh, not yeah. something that you really think of either. Right. Like, you know, yeah. Your mom's just telling you that she didn't have a problem and you've got a problem and you feel like a terrible mom. Well, although <laughs> that's not true. That's not the truth. Exactly. It's harder. It's harder for us now. It's just yeah. hard. Just a little bit harder, but the good news is every single one of those babies has it in those in, in them to sleep. You just need yeah. to give them the right chance to learn. And it helps to have a really proven program. Honestly, you don't want to be trial and erroring this for weeks and weeks and weeks on end when with the right plan, it can be, it can, it, your child can, can learn in a week. Yeah, exactly. And easily. And everybody's yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, so what's the biggest factor in helping babies and young kids learn to sleep through the night, do you find? The biggest factor is consistency on the part of the parents. The, the hardest part for a child, especially younger than five, is to um, learn how to do a skill when there's no consistency. So like falling asleep as a skill, like an independently falling asleep as a skill. So if sometimes they get rocked to sleep, but sometimes they get laid in their crib awake, sometimes their parents will pick them up and you know, right. feed them back to sleep with a bottle. Sometimes they'll, you know, let them cry for five or 10 minutes. Sometimes they'll, I mean, babies and toddlers do not operate in gray zones. No. They need them to be black and white. And the toddler brain really needs things to be black and white. Like if you yes. sometimes give them a cookie before dinner and sometimes don't, guess what? <laughs> You're having a battle with your child every night before dinner because they got one yesterday and sometimes they do. But yes. if it's an all out blanket, no. Yeah. Um, or it's an all out a hundred percent of the time. Yes. It's always this way. Yeah. Then they can learn then, then they can learn and that's what they need. So the parents need to be really consistent. So that's where it helps to have like, here's what to do. Yeah. Here's the plan. Follow this 
and just stay consistent with it. And then usually where I come in is checking in with those families on a daily basis. And the first few days, I like to do it on the phone and have a conversation about how, how things are going. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I touch base with them daily by email and having that accountability. I know when I did this six years ago and I had a sleep consultant, knowing that I was going to be talking to her the next day kept me on track at three o'clock in the morning on those first few nights when I had work to do. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't cave and I couldn't go back to the old way that I was doing things that was actually keeping my daughter stuck right? and not letting her sleep. So the biggest factor is parents' consistency. And if you find you're like fighting with your partner at three o'clock in the morning in the hallway outside your child's room about what to do, yeah. that's where it's really helpful to have someone outside of that relationship guiding you both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that completely makes sense because this is this is really a new habit for the child, you know, and no, at no matter what age they're at. And, um, you know, I mean, like with any habit, it's whether it's a new diet, whether it's exercise, whether it's sleeping, whatever it is, yeah. it's the consistency is the key there, you know, so that it's basically it can take root and be enforced. Right. Yep. And no exceptions. Yeah. No exceptions, yeah. You know, yeah. So, yeah, and I totally agree about the, um, you know, having the support because I find from, for me, from a business perspective, anytime I'm working with a coach, if I've said, <laughs> I'm going to have this done for tomorrow, well, I tell you, I'm having it done for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, you you commit. It just, you it commit. adds that extra layer of commitment, but yeah. it also gives you the support. But besides having them um, the, uh, the someone to bounce all of the what ifs off of and okay, well, this happened. And well, now what do I do? And this unexpected thing happened. I mean, you've got someone with you for like two to three weeks to answer every single one of your sleep questions. For yeah. three weeks. And there are lots that come up. There are a lot of families that are like, well, I don't know if I really need this. And then lo and behold, they get two or three days into this and they're like, okay, so what happens if this happens? And what happens if this happens? And what do I do if this happens? And, and so it's just really helpful just to have that. And then by the end of two or three weeks, my goal is that that family, though that, that um, parental unit, they're the experts now. Yeah. They are the experts. They'll always have me to kind of like come back to if they need it, you know, six months later, they went on a trip and things slid a little bit. And so they need to kind of do a refresh or they need to touch base for a question. That's always there. But my intention is that that family becomes, they know, they know how to help their child sleep and they know how to foster good habits and they know how to keep them on track. And that's my intention with every family I work with. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's great. Um, so I know we had sort of already discussed a little bit about why sleep is so important for babies and young kids and parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, is there anything else you wanted to touch on with that? Sure. Yeah. Oh, listen, you're going to have to stop me because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you've just given me a soapbox <laughs> to stand on and I can stand on that soapbox and talk for hours about how important sleep is. Oh my gosh. So um, one of the things that Kelly's going to do is l give a link to a download that you can um, that have from my uh, from my website, and it's a baby sleep schedules guide. But if you've got an older child and you're the, you're beyond the napping phase or something, I have a, another ebook. You can email me, and I can send you my ebook. And in there, I will go through and I distill all the research on not just sleep training and how effective and how safe and how helpful it is, especially for maternal mental health. Sleep is so important for maternal mental health. It is proven in study after study after study. Like there was too many to actually reference um, because it's just, it's so, it's, it's it, the, the link is so clear um, that sleep, enough, getting enough sleep is so important for maternal mental health. But also in that ebook is just how sleep affects us and how sleep deprivation affects us. So from the parent's perspective, like a lot of parents will have a little bit of guilt around this. They're like, well, you know, I had a baby. And so I have to get up two or three times a night, you know, for the next two years or three years or six months even. Um, well, that's what I signed up for. Well, and actually, no, <laughs> no, you signed, you definitely signed up to get up every three or four hours in the first three to four months because newborns need to feed every three to four hours. But once they get past like that three, four months, you should really only be waking up once a night to feed them back to sleep. And then once they get past like sort of six, seven months, 
they have the physiological ability to sleep 11 to 12 hours straight without a feed. So if they are still waking to feed, it's in the realm of habit then, not in the realm of need. So the guilt around that is like, you know, well, I shouldn't be really thinking about my own sleep. In fact, your sleep, if you're not getting enough sleep, it affects your cognition. It affects your ability to plan. It affects your judgment. It affects your focus. It affects your ability to drive safely. Yeah. So if you're waking up every few hours at six months and seven months and eight months, you're not safe to drive. And But you're putting your most precious little person in the backseat and getting behind the wheel. And your focus is if you are getting six uh, hours or less straight of straight sleep mm -hmm. for if that's all you're getting for two weeks, you have the blood alcohol, you have the equivalent cognition of someone who has a blood alcohol level at the legal limit. So you would never have a couple of beers and put your baby in the back seat and go for a drive. But we drive our kids sleep deprived all the time. And it's just as dangerous. So there's lots of studies about, you know, the day after daylight savings is coming up. The, the Monday morning after daylight savings, which is this Saturday night or Sunday morning, the yeah. Monday morning after has the highest statistical um, uh, rate of car accidents around North America. Anywhere that does daylight savings, you lose an hour of sleep. You still haven't caught up 24 hours later. Even an hour, even an hour makes a big difference. So if you're having these choppy nights waking up every few hours with your child, you're not getting enough sleep you're basically driving tipsy every day. Yes. So it's, it, it's really, really important, not just for, it's not a luxury for us to get enough sleep. We are doing the hardest job in the world, which is parenting little people. And if we're not at our best, we're not giving our best to them. Mm -hmm. So it's really selfless to make sure everyone in the family is sleeping enough. Um, because then when you look at your child, then there's this whole ream of, um, ways that sleep deprivation affects your child. Yeah. So it affects their learning. It affects their focus. It affects their emotional regulation. Exhibit A is the totally emotions coming out the ears toddler because they had a terrible night's sleep the night before, right? And you've seen it. You're laughing because you've seen it. I've seen it. I used to say, like, my kid on 11 to 12 hours sleep every night, best kid in the world. Yeah. Couldn't be, I, there's no one else I'd rather be around than this little girl. Yep. 10 and a half hours sleep out the window with you. Yep. Like it's just Jekyll and Hyde. And that's the difference of one hour. Yep. So for all those kids, and I've had lots of families come back and say, I have a different child. I have a different child. I've had other families that have said that, you know, we were seeing a speech therapist for delayed, delayed speech for our two and a half year old. He wasn't speaking and he was two and a half, couldn't express himself, melting down because he couldn't express himself and he's exhausted. Sin, right? Two weeks in, he's sleeping 12 hours a night and taking a two hour nap during the day and his speech explodes and the speech therapist discharges him, which wow. then led me down the path of, just, of kind of researching, wait a second, what's the connection between sleep and speech development? And so I've been actually giving talks to groups of speech therapists who are completely on board with this. They're like, of course, yes. of course, it's a cognitive function. Yes. If they're not sleeping enough to consolidate memory during the day, they, they cannot learn. They cannot learn the way that, that the way that they should. So there's so many, many reasons why getting enough sleep yeah. is important and, and not just saying, okay, you know, well, my kid's just not a great sleeper because I wasn't a great sleeper. You yeah. can't pass that stuff on to your kids. No. They all have it in them. They all have it in them to do this. It's true. You know, um, yeah, it sort of reminds me because I apparently was a horrible sleeper when I was a baby. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mom always gives me a hard time on it, blah, blah, blah. And she said she brought my sis my second sister home and mom would have to go in and check on her, right? Because she right. out like, like, are you still breathing? <laughs> yeah. Um, me then like the first time mom came over and babysat my little girl, well, she woke up crying once, right? So I come home and here's mom at like midnight with my little girl in her arms. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> right. She's gonna be sleeping. <laughs> Yeah. Well, she cried. Grandmothers are terrible at this. Like I always tell my the families that I work with, if you have a grandparent that's coming to visit, you need to you need to put this off until grandma goes because yeah. they're they're terrible at put at you know laying the boundary down. They're, yeah. Sleep training is not meant for them no. <laughs> because they don't suffer the consequences. They right? Don't. They well, don't. but this is what she used to do with me. 
if right. I cried, she'd pick me up. She's like, yeah, uh, three times a night. I'm like, well, it's because you- There was your culprit. <laughs> there was your culprit. You never had the chance. You never had the chance to consolidate your night. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah. interesting what you know now when you're older, right? Yep, yeah. But I mean, true, yeah, I guess like sleep, well, and I mean, you kind of preach to the choir in the last thing you said, really, because um, it's like sleep is feeding you just the same way as food is, you know, yeah. and if you don't get enough sleep, one thing I'm always saying is um, being tired affects your cortisol and insulin levels, right, mm -hmm. which directly affects mm -hmm. your visceral fat, which is the fat around your belly, right, mm -hmm. so not enough sleep literally makes you fat. Yes. <laughs> right so and cranky and cranky right and to just yeah i mean it, it's like with a lot of these like it puts you into a fight or flight mm -hmm. um, syndrome yep. you know and yeah which yep. in which case you're not digesting your food so you're not mm -hmm. fueling your brain so you know like your body isn't getting the nutrients and everything it needs mm -hmm. right so it's such a big Circle. Yeah, our worlds are actually really, really intertwined. Like the two, the two are so overlapping. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, and when you think about it, it's like food, water, and sleep. Without any of those things, you you die. Yeah. And in fact, you die without sleep before you die without food or water. Wow. That's how important sleep is. Yeah. Wow. That's how. Like, yeah. And it can. There's lots of. You know, you go down the rabbit hole of the of the sleep research, and there's lots of um, stuff about you know how drastically it cognitively affects us and the hallucinations and things like that that can happen after five days of sleep deprivation and then but you do it you can go without food or water longer than you can go without sleep amazing i know i know Great. me i can't really go more than 16 hours without needing to lie down for <laughs> eight or nine <laughs> well and it's true because i mean i find i can handle so much more when i've had a good night's sleep like if i haven't slept yeah. I'm emotional. I'm mm -hmm. either angry or crying. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, well, that's just even the subtle differences too, right? Like, like I'm not kidding when I say, in, in, anyone who's listening to this knows we are doing the hard. Parenting is the hardest job on the planet because the stakes are so high. Number one, mm -hmm. um, but number two, it's just you, you, you basically you brought these little button pushers into the world that are just put, pushing your buttons all day long. All the time. <laughs> It's great. They're teaching us where our buttons are. Like they're raising us, really. But um, I mean, the difference for for me, if I've had a perfect night's sleep, like for me, it's eight plus hours, eight eight and a half, um, and it's consolidated. I'm not woken up in the middle of the night. Then I'm. I have patience. I have patience with my little button pushers, and I can sit down and I say, "Okay, you two, we can do better than this." Who yeah. had the toy first? Okay, what's a compromise? And I do all those, you know, things that you read in parenting books. Yes. If I've had seven or less hours or someone's sick and I've been waking up, I'm like, give me the toy. You get over there. You get over there. And I just, I can't, I can't do the right thing. Right? It's just not in me. And it's really shocking to, for, to see the difference in myself between seven hours mm -hmm. and eight hours. Yep. And it really only takes that. So if you're chronically sleep deprived because you think you're doing the best thing for your child, which is having them sleep in your bed and kick you in the face all night, yeah. or you think you're doing the best thing for your child by going to them and picking them up every two to three hours yeah. to rock them back to sleep, you're not, you're, you're absolutely not. And no. while it might take some commitment and some work for a few days to yeah. a week, sometimes a touch more. And usually it's just ironing out the kinks at that point. Yeah. Um, you will, you will see the difference. You yes. will definitely see the difference in like, okay, you know what? Now I can do my best. Yeah. Now I can do the right thing for my kids, for yeah. my baby, for my child. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true too. Cause like, that's one thing I'm always saying is in order to be the best mom you can be, you need to take care of yourself, right? You have to put your own mask on first, right? Yep. You know, definitely. And with sleep, you're putting both masks on simultaneously. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I always say it always takes the parents longer because they're, they're doing that. Are they breathing? Are they, are they really doing this? I like, and the parents can't believe it. They can't, they just, they, they've been walking on eggshells for so long wondering, okay, when's the next time they're going to wake up subconsciously wondering when's the next time they're going to wake up that they're probably not even sleeping well when they are sleeping. Yeah. So, yeah. It's the, it's, but when, when, um, your child learns how to sleep mm -hmm. 
their mask is on and they are functioning on all cylinders and they can learn how to emotionally regulate and they can learn how to share and they can learn period how to speak how to how to do cognitive tasks and then for us once we start sleeping because we we start to trust that oh my gosh they really are they're really doing this they're really doing this every night my husband and i high fived each other every bedtime yeah here after our child started to sleep every night we're like i can't believe she, i can't believe she just does this and she wakes up happy yeah. toward us right and yeah. and so then you're you then you can put your mask on because you know your child is sleeping so yeah. they everybody gets a mask yes exactly yeah. right um so how much sleep do you think kids really need every night mm -hmm. good question um because a lot there's a lot of misconception out there and some parents just you know kid goes to bed at nine o'clock and wakes up at six for everyone to get out the door to work and that is just way too little so what most children need starting at about sort of three four months it's really variable in the newborn phase they're, they're sleeping a lot and often um but starting at about three months to you know a year and a half sort of thing when they're they switch down to one nap um they're having several naps a day a good nap is an hour and a half mm -hmm. to two hours um, last nap of the day is usually a little cat nap, yeah. but nighttime is 11 to 12 hours straight through the night. Yeah. Now between three and six or seven months, they need, still need a feed. Yeah. I always keep a feed in there when I'm working with families with babies that age, there is a way to sleep train while still keeping a feed yeah. and it works really, really well. Um, but basically 11 to 12 hours a night from, you know, the early months until they're seven, eight, nine years old. And once they get up until sort of eight, nine years old, well, you know what, then they can have an eight o'clock bedtime, but really it's seven to seven thirty. Yeah. Um, all babies and toddlers, preschoolers and young school children between yeah. seven and seven thirty is an age appropriate bedtime. And yeah. then once they start getting to sort of like the eight, nine years old, then they can have an eight o'clock bedtime. And you know what, hang on to that eight o'clock bedtime and don't, um, don't waver on it. Yeah. until they start getting to sort of 12, 12, 13. And then once they get into the teenage years, the whole circadian rhythm shifts into a much later idea of what nighttime is. That's a brain change that happens. That's what drives parents nuts. And they can't get their kids out of bed in the morning because yeah. their brains have actually shifted. But until that happens, the early, early bedtime is the um, biggest link between adequate sleep and appropriate sleep. If you get your kids to bed, or, to bed early, they will sleep enough. Yeah. But if they're up, you know, and I've talked to lots of parents who's, you know, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds are going to bed at 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, and it's just too late. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. My little guy, he's in bed, um, books read and everything, like, you know, <clears throat> lights off. Out. Seven. Yeah. Um, and my little girl... Like we start bedtime 6.30, right? So between 6.30 and 7 is yeah. routine teeth. time. Routine yeah. time, right? And then yeah. you know, my little girl, who she's the older one, she's seven. And she starts at seven and same thing, uh, in your room, um, 7.30. Yep. Um, books read, da-da-da. Now she'll, she'll take her flashlight and she'll look at books for, I don't know, yep. maybe an extra half an hour. But she's yep. at that point, she's settled. She's winding down. And mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. And when kids are, when kids are used to it and they have a routine that doesn't really waver and you know, there's always the odd family occasion exception, but if yeah. they have a routine that doesn't really ever waver, um, then there's no battle. No. They just go to bed yeah. and bedtime can actually be the really the sweetest time between parents and children because it's just something that uh, is so natural and mm -hmm. so easy. And the kids are so confident with it that they just say, night mom. Yeah. And they're totally cool with it. It's not, a, it's not an issue. So I love, I really love seeing the kids who struggled with bedtime, have anxiety around it or battles around it, or just overtired. I love seeing that magical change when they just say night, night mom. Yes. Yeah. A little stuffy and they, they do it. And it's great, right? It is great. <laughs> And one thing I noticed too is when we were, when we fixed up my little guy's sleep habits, he, cause I don't know if you remember, but he was waking up at like five o'clock in the morning or right. something like that, right? Five, five thirty, right? And we're like, no, <laughs> right? 
and now it's about seven, right? So less. Yeah, that's as good as it gets. Yeah, right. Yeah. So both of them get up at seven. It's so sweet too because she'll go and get him um, a snack <laughs> right? oh. on a weekend. So you get to you get a little lion. A little lion. Magical things right. happen. Magical little things like that happen when kids know how to sleep. Like it's really, really sweet. It is. It really yep. is. You know. So yeah. Um, so I know one thing you had mentioned earlier that I just kind of want to swing back to. You said, um, like you had mentioned. It, you know, it, it's not like you let them ball their eyes out and shut the door goodbye, right? So. Um, you don't seem to really focus on the cry it out method. Right. I always say to families when they ask me, is this the cry it out method? I'm like, you don't need to call someone and pay someone for you to let your child cry it out. You just shut the door and walk away. That's what cry it out. That's what cry it out really means. So there's a lot of misconception um, that when people read about cry it out online or in you know, blogs or hear about it, that's what it means. Yeah. And that's the old school way of doing it. Like when parents, kids were not sleeping, couldn't sleep through the night, they just shut the door and they just let them cry it out. And you know what? It, it worked for the most part. It worked. Now I have had lots of families, not lots, because not very many people want to try this anymore. Um, but I have had a few families who have resorted to that yeah. and it worked for a while. It does tend to backfire and you need to redo. And I don't think anybody really wants to do that. And the good news is that there's much more supportive options that actually still work. Yeah. So uh, the supportive option is where you get to be right beside your baby, your toddler, your preschooler, as they learn this really critically important life skill. Yeah. You get to be right beside them. You can still soothe them, talk to them, but it's very specific. So that's what I do is I guide families into what are ways that you can soothe your child without getting in their way of learning how to sleep on their own? Because we all need to learn how to sleep on our own. It's just an important part of our health and our life and our functioning. So how do we soothe them without getting in their way? And so that's what the whole seven page plan is all about. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and how about big kids? Like how do those sleep plans, sorry, sleep plans differ from the ones that you use for babies? Yeah. So, you know, starting at the toddler year, so sort of two and a half and up, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of strategy involved because as we know, kids who are that age, they're strategizing. Mm -hmm. so we, we have to bring our A game, <laughs> but really, oops, sorry. <laughs> it really, it's about um, working with the developing, the level of development of their brain. So yeah. really knowing like, how does the toddler brain function? How does the preschooler's brain function? You know, preschoolers really express themselves through play and they're starting to express their emotions through play. And so you incorporate um, some really, really key strategies to help get them on board for a change to their sleep. So if there's a change to their habits, like, you know, they're used to having mom or dad lie down with them in their bed for two hours every night, and then they're waking up in the night looking for mom and dad to come back into the bed, really common scenario. Um, yes. And the parents are not sleeping in the same bed anymore. And the kid has starting to get fears because they can't fall asleep on their own. They can't mm -hmm. be alone in their room and all of that sort of stuff that actually develops from the sleep habit, not the other way around. Usually oh. um, there's a lot of working with their, the level of their developing brain yeah. to introduce strategies during the day, actually, and pre bedtime yeah. and at bedtime and middle of the night, it's much more involved. Yeah. Um, in ways that help get the child on board for the change. And then you, then you, do, then you do the how-to of gradually removing yourself from their process of falling asleep at a rate that they can really do it. Yes. So you're not gonna say to a seven-year-old who's always had their parent lie down with them to fall asleep, oh wait, you're on your own now. This is, we're done. Our marriage is falling apart because we haven't slept in the same room for seven years. So you need to figure this out. Like that's just, it's just never going to work. You have to, you have to guide them and you have to support them and you have to build their confidence and you have to empower them and you have to help them develop a sense of security with their place of sleep. So a lot of the big kid plans, um, and then with the, with the really big kid, the five to 10 year olds, there's anti-anxiety stuff that you have to bring in too about actually addressing the anxieties and the fears. And there's 
kid friendly ways to educate them about what's happening in their brain when all these fears and big feelings are coming up. And so there's a lot of um, educating the kids, but guiding the parents and giving them that how to remove yourself from the situation that you're in and how to make this colossal change in your family, yeah. but also supporting the child at the level that they're capable of understanding and a level that helps them actually build their security with sleep and not creates more fears. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that, that sounds, um, so much easier <laughs> than just being like, okay, see ya. <laughs> yeah. It, and then, then taking the disciplinary route, like, cause it's not a, it's, it, you know, there, these are real feelings. The child has developed real feelings and fears and attachments around certain, and I don't mean parent child attachment. I mean like just being attached to the way things are and they don't want it to change. And, and I understand that because human beings don't like change. Little no. kids are no different. Right. So, um, so, you know, just ad addressing all of that and not going at it from a disciplinary um, uh, approach, like, you know, it's time you learn to do this and you got to stay in your room. And I said, stay because I said, so it's just not going to work. It's just yeah. not going to work. And if it does work, it's working to develop more fear and more insecurity in the child. Yeah. Way more fun to empower them than to see the end result is just awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're so, they can be so amazing. Like sometimes, you know, when they're, when they're on point, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's really cool to see. Um, so what kind of results do families usually see after going through one of your programs? Um, the first goal, I, there's, there's a few main goals that I work with, with every family. Number one is that the child learns how to fall asleep independently. So that, and for a baby, it's a matter of like connecting the, the neurons in their brain for how to do this skill. For an older child, it's like doing it for the first time so that they can start to build that confidence that they can do it. So falling independently, and that could be with the parent, you know, just a few feet away, but doing it independently is goal number one. And then stretching out the sleep so that they get a longer night um, or there's no breaks in the night. So consolidating their sleep. And then finally doing it consistent, consistently can making that happen every night, night after night. And for that to be the norm, unless of course they're sick, they're coughing, they've got a fever and then, then yeah. you're on. Then yeah. that is actually what nighttime parenting should be. Mm -hmm. Nighttime parenting shouldn't be you're awake half the night or you're woken up several times through the night. That is not normal. That's not normal sleep behavior. And that's not what nighttime parenting really is about. Nighttime parent is like, you're on because they're sick, they have a fever, they're, you know, throwing up and you're holding their ponytail or whatever it is. Like that's the normal nighttime parenting that should only happen once in a blue moon. Yeah, so those are, the, those are the results that, that every single family I work with should expect. And, you know, 99% of them get there. Excellent. Yeah. I guess it's, you know, it's not normal. It's probably common, but not normal. Right. Right. right exactly. So, I mean, for anybody out there who's watching who could be struggling with childhood sleep, um, you know, you're certainly not alone. You're not, you're not the only one. It oh is, my gosh, no. Right? Very no. common. Yeah. Um, but it can be better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It can be, it can be colossally better. Like yeah. it's, it's a very, very big difference for that family that's constantly struggling and battling um, to suddenly like put your child down and say good night and they say good night and you're shocked and then you go and you have an evening with your spouse or you go out or you go to bed early or you watch a movie or yeah. whatever you do you have that time to yourself to refuel and recharge and mm -hmm. prep for the next day whatever you need to do and then you're still going to get your eight hours sleep and wake up feeling refreshed and everyone's happy it's yeah. remarkable well and yeah i mean because i've um, I've heard two people say like, after the kids finally get to bed, I'm just so wiped myself that all I can do is sit on the couch and, you know, just watch Netflix. And then I myself stay up until like one o'clock in the morning, way too late. I meant to go to bed earlier. Right. But they were so late going to bed, you but know, because, because the parents feel like I want some me time. Yeah, exactly. I hear, I hear that a lot too, Kelly, yeah. is that, you know, it's like, you know, I I, I stay up late and I don't get enough sleep because I want some time to myself and my kids not falling asleep till 9 p.m. So I'm up till 11. Yeah. So 
there's a solution. Exactly. Right. So it's, yeah, you get them to bed earlier so that you can yeah. have, you can have your me time, whether that's yeah. at night or you go to bed early and you have your me time in the morning, whatever works, you yeah. know, but you do need that me time for you to mm -hmm. recharge. But the only way you're going to do that is if your kids are getting enough sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You know? Um, so what's the first step for a parent who's listening and struggling with their baby's sleep, um, toddler bedtime battles, or their older child's bedtime anxiety? First step is just let's have a conversation about it. So that's why I do the free call. Yeah. Um, because people, first of all, they need, to, they need to figure out who I am and what I'm going to do because this is their child. Like yeah. you just can't trust someone with their child. You got to, we got to have a conversation first. So go to my website and book a free call. Even if you want to just know more about what it is I do, mm -hmm. um, or just to talk about, you know, is, is my issue something that you can work with? I get that call a lot. Like, is this something that you can help with? And so just to have the conversation is the first step. And obviously there's no obligation. We just have a conversation about it. Step one. And it's really easy. You just go on my website, book a free call. The link is all over the place and we'll just have a conversation about it because like Kelly said, you're not alone. This happens a lot. This happens way more than it did in our parents' generation. Um, and there is a solution and the solution is doable for every family, every child, and you can, you can get there. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, um, I don't know, do I have any other questions other than that? Da, 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 da. Yeah, no, my other question would have been, um, how can people find you? So what I'm going to do is in the comments, okay. I'm going to put your website address, um, okay. a link to your, your giveaway, your, um, your guide, right? Yeah. What's the name of your guide? Baby sleep schedules guide. Baby so sleep. It, it's, it will, it will help for anyone in the first sort of 18 months of their child's, um, life is to know like how often should they should they nap? How long should they be awake for at every age? So if you're listening and you've got a baby, um, you can sign up and I'll just, you'll just get the baby sleep schedules guide. If you've got an older child, send me an email. My email's on the website, hillarysleep.com and just send me an email and I'll send you um, my ebook that I wrote that talks about the importance of sleep, sleep research, sleep for kids, sleep for grownups, all that stuff. Awesome. And uh, I was thinking about it today for anybody who is um, listening, who's in your tribe, what I'm going to do, I have a top 10 foods for exhausted moms so that they can get their energy back. Yes, so please. I'm going to take that too. I'm, I will give that to you. I will send yeah. you the link. Is chocolate cake on there? Is chocolate cake on that list? No, probably not. No. <laughs> You know, I had to ask. <laughs> good quality chocolate, like a, a good quality dark chocolate is yes. really good for you. You know, so. I'm so grateful for that. I know, <laughs> me too. <laughs> That's great. So um, I would love to share that. I will, I will definitely share that. Yeah. So for any of your, any of your people who um, are listening in when you share this to your tribe, then I will, that's my giveaway to them for listening to to us. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. There's a lot of moms who would love that. Um, any parting thoughts? I like your last question. What's the first, what's the first step? Because that first step is so hard to take because you're in a groove and when you're sleep deprived, it's very hard to make a decision. So know that if you're not sleeping eight plus hours every night, mm -hmm. you are chronically sleep deprived. Yeah. So be easy on yourself. Know that it's hard to make decisions and just like uh, click and have a phone call so that we can start the ball rolling or at least just have a conversation about it. And then you will be able to make decisions and then you will be able to do all the things that you used to do pre-child. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just know that you're sleep deprived. If you're getting less than eight hours consolidated sleep every night, less than seven is definitely sleep deprivation. Yeah. Um, and then know that it's be easy on yourself and know that it's hard to make a decision. And so just book a phone call. We'll have a conversation and I will help you through the decision-making process so that you make the best decision for your family. Awesome. Um, 
So uh, we're pretty much wrapping up here now. I don't know if anybody is live that would like to ask a question. I can't tell in this format if anybody's live or not. <laughs> okay. Um, so you've got about a minute uh, or so to ask a question if you want to. Um, so yeah, uh, other than that, I really want to say thank you for having this chat today. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's like, this was great. I think this was a fantastic collaboration. And I'm really hoping that this helps some of the moms who are out there who honestly, like, it's like, I just, I can't even um, think about taking care of myself because, mm -hmm. you know, I just, I don't get enough sleep because my own child yeah. is sleeping, you know? Yeah. Um, and guess what? I know what it's like, because like I said, I went through the same thing mm -hmm. for the first three or four, three years of my little guy's yeah. life. It was brutal. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, it's yeah. hard. It is. It is hard, you know? So it's just um make the call you know it, it can be hard to make the call um but make the call i went through it um and with hillary's help um it, it, you're on the other side i'm on yeah that's it you know i'm yeah. on the other side right yeah. so much more energy because to to take care of myself yes um, and nighttime now like bedtime now is really sweet you know like my little girl has started reading to me now <laughs> she's reading Horton Hears a Who <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome I love hearing that because when the battle is gone and the tension around sleep is gone in the household and it's just something so natural and so easy and if you're listening and you think yeah you don't know my kid I do <laughs> I do I've seen it all I've heard it all and I've seen them all turn around it is possible for every family and then bedtime will become as sweet as it is for Kelly's family. It's just the sweetest time of day. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I don't see any questions come in. So That's okay. Um, they know where to find me. Yes. And uh, I'm going to put the replay up in, uh, in the group, but I'll also put it on my Facebook page and I'm going to send okay. it to you so you can post it as well. Great. Awesome. Okay. So, Thanks for having me, Kelly. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for, for coming on. Um, I think this is going to be super valuable. And like I said, I'm going to put in the comments um, Hillary's information so that you can okay. reach out to her and so that you can get your free tie. Okay. All right. We will talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Sleep well, everyone. Sleep well. <laughs>